Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Simon Turpin. I'm the Executive Director of Answers and Genesis UK. And since we're all still um, being isolated in our homes, we thought we'd continue to bring um, some more interviews with um, scientists, with creation speakers. And um, I'm really pleased to introduce my guest tonight, Professor uh, Stuart Burgess. Often, you know, Stuart doesn't need any introduction, but I'll go ahead and um, give him one. Stuart is um, leading, one of the leading engineers actually in, in this country because I think you won uh, the 2019, uh, was it the James Clayton Prize, Stuart? Um, That's right, yeah. Engineer. yeah. And so you're a um, professor at Bristol University. Yeah. And as you can see in the background, Stuart has written some really great books over the years, um, Hallmarks of Design and a recent book along with Professor Andy McIntosh, uh, Wonders of Creation. So when um, we put this up, we'll put the links to those books um, in, in the comments section. So if you want to look into those books, um, you can just find them in the comments section. But Stuart, why don't you begin um, by telling people some of your background, how you got into uh, speaking on creation? Uh, well, I've been involved in engineering design for around 30 years, uh, not just teaching engineering design, but also researching the subject and also practicing design as well, designing products like spacecraft, Olympic bicycles, um, various other engineering items. And from my experience, I've learned that design does not happen by chance. And that's not just true for engineering, but I've also had the privilege of studying design in nature. For example, studying bird feathers, studying trees. And I can see even more intricate design in creation than even engineering. And not just design, but also beauty as well. And because I've seen that over the years, and uh, not just in theory, but researching things in the lab. And uh, I've been very much struck by the practical science I've done revealing evidence of intelligent design and creation. So I wanted to uh, tell other people mm -hmm. about that evidence. Great. So I know you often talk, um, you have a talk, um, is biblical creation good science? And we often hear about, you know, evolution is, is science. But Tell us what is biblical creation? Uh, basically, it's a worldview that involves belief in the Bible and the God of the Bible. So it includes a number of things. Uh, firstly, it includes intelligent design, the principle that life could not appear by chance accident, and that the complexity we see in the world could not just come about by accident. It must be some kind of intelligent designer but it's much more than just belief in an intelligent designer it's also a belief uh, that the creator is the god of the bible uh, and and not just that uh, that creation reveals god's attributes uh, particularly his goodness because mm -hmm. um, you could believe in an intelligent designer but not know anything about that designer or his attributes and not just uh, believing in god's good attributes as explained in the Bible, but also believing that creation was made the way the Bible reveals it. So six day creation. So biblical creation is a lot more than intelligent design. So then as a scientist, you have no problem with the fact that God created in six days and the world isn't billions of years old. It's actually quite young according to the Bible. Yeah, I have no difficulty in that. Uh, at all. When you think of uh, like some of the most fundamental laws of science, like the first law of thermodynamics that says you cannot create matter and energy from, from nothing. When you think of that law, you realize there must be an almighty power that brings everything into existence. When you think of the second law of thermodynamics, that um, everything is in a state of decay, you need an almighty power to create order in the universe. Once you realize that there must be a creator God with almighty power, it's not difficult to believe that he could create a mature, fully functioning creation as explained in Genesis. Mm -hmm. And so given 
you're a Christian, you, you believe the Bible, you believe it's a revelation from God, uh, it speaks of God's glory in creation. How then does your biblical worldview um, affect your scientific research? Uh, well, I've always felt that it's very helpful for my, for my science and engineering. It's a real inspiration to me. One of the reasons for that is that if you believe in biblical creation, it gives you an expectation of supreme design in the natural world. When, if I was to look at a bird or a tree or an insect, I'm very open-minded to there being brilliant, elegant design. And that's a real help to me. Uh, just to give you one example, I've been researching the knee joint for around 15 years. I never would have looked inside the knee joint if I wasn't a biblical creationist uh, because you know you, you would just imagine a joint would be simple but I thought that's not going to be simple there's going to be something complicated in there and when I looked there was something immensely complicated with these linkage mechanisms and cams and I would say the same with a dragonfly if you read a modern school book on dragonflies it says they're primitive creatures that appeared millions of years ago but I didn't believe that I thought there will be something complicated in that. And there was something really complicated and it's led to funded research and a lot of publications. Uh, so your, that worldview has really, has really helped me. But not only that, uh, the Bible tells us that man is made in the image of God. And I find that inspiring that I'm uh, designed to be a creative being. Uh, not just uh, some kind of advanced ape. So I find that inspiring from my uh, science, but also I have great confidence in the world that it's ordered, that materials are high quality, that God's given us everything we need. So I find it very helpful in lots of ways. So when you look at the, the human body, for example, although we're told on a daily basis, um, we've evolved from ape-like creatures, you know, there's a common ancestry, in fact, I think it wasn't it. Um, Alice Roberts did a program recently on the BBC talking about human evolution. But I've often listened to you, and when you say, if you look at the body, it's it's obvious there's a it's been designed. Can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, one of the things because I've written another book, uh, the Design and Origin of Man, and one of the main arguments in that book is that humans are overdesigned. They're designed for more than survival, because an important principle of evolution, which is admitted by evolutionists, is that evolution, if we had evolved, we could only have a kind of design just enough just to survive. But when you look at the human being in detail, it's clear we're over-designed. We're designed for far more than survival from head to toe. Our brains are clearly far more clever than they need to be just to survive. Our hands are brilliantly designed to play the violin, play musical instruments, do surgery. You don't need those to do those things just to survive. And when you think of the human voice, how beautifully it can sing, why do we need that just to survive? And uh, there's a whole list of things. You can uh, think about our taste buds. We appreciate uh, very tasty food. We can appreciate beauty and music. Our whole body is designed for far more than just survival. I think that's uh, one of the great challenges to evolution. Yeah. And, you know, we're often told in the media, people like Richard Dawkins, again, Alice Roberts will say, if you believe in the Bible, you can't do good science. But in what way does evolution hinder scientific research from, from your opinion? You know, we hear things like junk DNA and the appendix is a vestigial organs. How does the, the evolutionary worldview actually hinder real scientific research? Well, the problem with evolution is you have this expectation of bad design. If you read books by Richard Dawkins and others, uh, one of their great beliefs is that the world must be badly designed. And I understand why they say that, because if evolution were true, you would see bad design all over the place. But this belief in bad design can really hinder the science. Um, you just mentioned the example of DNA. When the genome was uh, first revealed, 
it was a great surprise to scientists because it didn't just code for proteins. There was lots of other information. Now the evolution worldview uh, told scientists that must be junk DNA. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't surprised when they had this big label of junk DNA because that's what evolution predicts. It predicts yeah. bad design junk. So they labeled it as that. And really that held back science because after a time period, they realized they made a mistake. It wasn't junk DNA. Now, the Christian worldview would have said right from the beginning, that won't be junk. <laughs> that's going to be sophisticated. So yeah. that's a really clear example. But just to give you one other one, uh, Richard Dawkins in, the, in his books claims that the eye is badly designed because it's wired backwards. And I understand why he said that. Because again, he's expecting bad design. He's almost hoping to see bad design. But he was proved very wrong because they've now discovered these Muller cells yeah. that show that the eye is not wired backwards, but light is guided through these amazing fiber optic cells. But it's another example of where evolution says, don't bother looking because it should be bad. So evolution is often telling people, don't bother looking for great design because we're not expecting anything great. We're expecting things bad. And time after time, eventually we discovered, well, there is good design and it would have been better <laughs> if you'd look for it in the first place. So when we look at the eye, it's, it's not actually badly designed. It's designed with a purpose, right? Yeah, it's brilliantly designed. Uh, just a couple of months ago, I wrote an article in the Answers magazine how not just the human eye, but all eyes in creation, whether it's the eagle eye, even the eye of a worm, each one is a brilliant design for that particular creature. You can't fault the design of uh, eyes. It, it, it marvels of creation. Yeah. And so people will often bring up, look, you know, we get knee ache, you need knee, hip replacements, knee replacements. You've already spoken about the knee. From a biblical point of view, even though when you look at the knee, it's so well designed, how do you, how do we account then for not bad design, but for having to replace knees, hips and aches and bones and things like that? Uh, well, it's, it's good what you just said, because there is a difference between design and disease. Yeah. Uh, you can't fault the design of a knee, but of course we wish they didn't wear out and there wasn't such thing as arthritis and problems. But the Bible does give a clear answer to that. That The Bible says that when God first created the world, it was perfect. There was no arthritis at the beginning of creation. There was no death. Uh, but death and disease and suffering came in with Adam and Eve when they sinned and rebelled. A consequence of that sin uh, was that creation was cursed. And it was an enormous change on creation. So death, disease, suffering, arthritis, that wasn't God's initial design that came later the bible has that right at the beginning of the bible in genesis chapter three and and it's uh it's part of the whole gospel there's the good news uh, that god has given a solution to that that he yeah. sent uh, the lord jesus to, to have that victory over death and suffering yeah so the fact that for example you're wearing glasses now for your eyes is, is not evidence of bad design it's evidence of we live in a fallen world and our bodies are deteriorating and wearing out. And we need, yep. we need we look forward to the redemption of our bodies. That's right. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve would not have worn glasses. <laughs> and in fact, even after being expelled, Adam and Eve probably wouldn't have needed glasses because Adam and Eve would have been very healthy and fit. Uh, yeah. Things have been in decay for thousands of years. Um, so Adam and Eve would have been had a lot less arthritis and other problems that we have. Yeah. And so let me ask you another question about um, scientists, because, you know, as I said before, the atheists, the, the skeptics of the age talk about the fact that you can't be, um, believe in the Bible, believe in Genesis and, and be a scientist. <laughs> um, but were there any scientists when Darwin, you know, Darwin was releasing his theory who were skeptical of evolution or, have all scientists throughout history always been advocates of Darwinian evolution? Uh, well, the facts, the facts of history are that some of the greatest scientists at the time of Darwin did not like his theory. And 
uh, many students and children not aware of this in mm -hmm. schools and universities. Just to give you some example, uh, Lord Kelvin, a very famous British scientist, fellow of the Royal Society, Cambridge educated. Lord Kelvin is the father of thermodynamics and uh, our unit for temperature, Kelvin, comes after him. Yeah. So he's the father of modern thermodynamics, a really great scientist. And he was a very firm believer in intelligent design. He said modern science uh, should be compelled to believe in creative power. He said that a biogenesis, the idea that life could come from a chemical soup, he said that's totally absurd. He said that in around 1900, way before we even knew of the, the great complexities yeah. of the cell. So he ridicules the, the, the idea of evolution. Uh, that's just one. And then we have Sir Ambrose Fleming, the father of electronics. Uh, he was a little bit after Lord Calvin. He was doing his science right at the beginning of the 20th century. He actually started the evolution protest movement, the first um, anti-evolution movement in the world. Started it in around 1932, I think, in Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he was horrified at the way science was adopting evolution. Then there's James Clark Maxwell. Some would say the greatest scientist that ever lived, the father of modern physics. And he said molecules were so beautifully designed. It was a great evidence of intelligent design. Then there's Michael Faraday and, and others. There's a whole raft of scientists who did not like uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. Okay. So when we think about the men who really pushed um, on old earth, people like James Hutton, um, Charles Lyell, and even Darwin, who built upon their, their work, where do they stand? Because they're seen as scientists. Um, were they scientists and where do they rank among people like Fleming and James Clark Maxwell uh, and other great scientists, Christ men, men who are Christians? Uh, well, those early figures who were pushing evolution, uh, most of them were kind of amateur scientists. Charles Darwin was educated in theology. Uh, Sir John Lubbock was a, a banker. Others were educated in classics and other subjects. I mean, and of course, one must give credit to Darwin for actually doing some very clever observations yeah. of, of adaptation. Uh, but what people have really misunderstood is that adaptation is all that he observed. He never observed evolution. So he did do some clever work on adaptation. But when you compare him with those great scientists, uh, they were like minnows compared to those great men. Yeah. So they don't even compare, really. And uh, well, talking about Darwin, you know, in this country, in, in the United Kingdom, uh, many of the pastors and the theologians in, in the Bible colleges would, would have no problem with saying God used evolution uh, to create the world. But did Charles Darwin believe that God would have used evolution to create? Uh, I, I saw a quotation from him saying that because of his belief in evolution, he therefore could not believe that the Bible was the word of God and therefore he didn't believe in Jesus Christ, yeah. God's son. So I think it destroyed his faith mm -hmm. and it damaged other things as well. He said he lost his appreciation of beauty. It didn't seem to be very good for him uh, <laughs> at all. And I am rather surprised how many theologians put their confidence in, in evolution for a number of reasons. Firstly, because the the Bible doesn't support theistic evolution at all. Yeah. Uh, Romans 5 says death came through Adam uh, and lots of other verses that make theistic evolution just not possible, that you can't have death before the fall of Adam and Eve. But I'm also surprised because myself, I've worked in academia for about 30 years. I mix with a lot of scientists. And when I ask scientists who aren't, Christian, they don't have any religious agenda. I say, do you have confidence in evolution? And the most common answer is they do not. Even the biologists I speak to say they don't have confidence in evolution and they admit they believe it because they don't like to believe in anything else. It's yeah, like yeah. a worldview. And yet you can see theologians making the mistake that they think that science is confident in evolution and uh, Many scientists can see that evolution is just a theory. It's absolutely not a fact. It's not operational 
science it's historical science historical science is notoriously speculative and unreliable and so i'm just so surprised that theologians put their confidence in a theory that scientists don't have confidence in yeah so there's no reason for for pastors to feel that they need to accommodate the word of god to a theory that really hasn't produced any good scientific research that's a really important point uh, I think that's a good way of, of putting it. There's been such a misunderstanding. Um, one thing I find encouraging when I speak to uh, students or just people on the streets, kind of lay people, I'm surprised how often they're skeptical of evolution. You know, how do we, could we really have come from um, apes? So I see more skepticism amongst lay people than I do amongst theologians, which yeah. is strange. And, and, the th when you when I know when Richard Dawkins and, and people like Alice Roberts or Stephen Hawking would hear things like that, they would say, "Well, that's because you really don't understand evolution." Now, do you think that's the case, or do you think it's because yeah, people do understand and they just don't believe it? I think people have more understanding than we sometimes give credit for. Mm -hmm. If you just take the the really key test of uh, abiogenesis. Uh, that's one of the biggest challenges to evolution. Could life really come from a chemical soup? They've been trying to create life from a chemical soup in the lab over 80 years. They haven't done it. That's devastating evidence against evolution. Yeah. They cannot produce it in the best labs with the best equipment, the best professors. Uh, you know, a neutral person would say, well, surely that's evidence for creation if you can't create it in the lab. I think a lot of lay people, a lot of the general public, do understand uh, the problem for evolution of, of mm -hmm. abiogenesis, that there's no evidence that life can just come from a chemical soup. And a lot of people do think, hang on, how can you have nothing and that nothing exploded and that created <laughs> us and then a chemical just kind of turned into life? A lot of people look at that and say, hang on, this is common sense. It's common sense. Yeah. that you need a creator so i think there is an element of common sense and even a child can apply that common sense and say yeah we need you know there, there must be a creator when you think of romans chapter 1 verse 20 it says from the beginning of creation god's attributes are clearly seen you don't need a phd to understand origins uh, it's been clearly seen it's always been clearly seen and if anything, it's getting clearer with yeah. microscopes and telescopes. So the real issue really isn't the evidence. It's, it's the worldview battle over naturalism versus biblical theism. That's, that's yeah. The... I think that's one of the most important things to understand. Uh, that's the mistake some theologians have made. It is a battle of worldviews. It's an emotional argument, a spiritual argument. It is a battle of worldviews. Uh, and people see the same evidence in a very different way depending on their worldview yeah so you just mentioned romans 120 which tells us about god the evidence for god uh, be clearly seen in in creation and obviously psalm 19 tells us the heavens declare uh, the glory of god in fact it pours forth speech day after day um as one of the leading designers in the world what would be your favorite or, or, or maybe the most compelling uh, evidence for a designer? Uh, it's a difficult question because I see compelling evidence permeating every part of uh, creation. Um, one candidate would be the human voice. To hear uh, a trained singer singing beautifully, it's the most incredible uh, thing, the acoustics of the human voice. That would definitely be um, a strong candidate. But I'm also very keen on the beauty of creation and the beauty of a peacock feather would be another candidate for yeah. the precision and beauty and uh, the whole coordination of beauty of a peacock feather and the peacock itself is really, is really stunning. Then there's bird song and I could just go on <laughs> and make a long list. Yeah. And it doesn't, isn't the peacock feather um, degrading over time, which is obviously evidence that it isn't evolving or hasn't evolved, rather it has been created. Yeah, there is a scientific paper and it has a title along the lines of how the peacock lost its spots. And in the very first few sentences, the researchers say they were really surprised. 
they did studies over lots of generations of peacocks. And to their great surprise, they said there was a degradation of beauty. Mm -hmm. Now, that's exactly what creationists predict, that things do change in creation. They change they degrade they don't change upwards yeah uh, creationists don't argue that things don't change uh, but the change is degrading and the evidence is that things are degrading every year many creatures are becoming extinct no new creatures are appearing and and beauty is degrading but yeah uh thankfully in heaven everything will be restored <laughs> fully. so in the in the peacock feather you see both um the, the su superb design of the creator, but you also see the effect of the fall, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's an important point. Yeah. Um, everything, if you study anything in the whole of creation, you, you have signs of that degrading. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're probably coming to the end of our time. Just sort of on, on, on one last point. If there are people watching this and, and they're not convinced, they have doubts about, you know, God, um, Genesis 1, the creation evolution, or pastors wondering about that, given that people now have a lot of time on their hands, what encouragement would you give Christians to say, you know, this is why we need to take God's word seriously and, and how compelling Genesis 1 is um, to, to speak of God creating the way he did? Uh, I think uh, the creation message is really important. It's, it's a foundation to the gospel. Um, it helps you to appreciate uh, appreciate the gospel. Um, I mean, Genesis is very foundational uh, to the Bible. It, it, knowing the Creator and and appreciating Genesis for what it teaches helps you to appreciate the world more. To yeah. appreciate beauty, I would encourage people to uh, during this time of isolation to make the most of websites. <laughs> Aunts in Genesis have a really superb website and if you have a particular question if you google answer in genesis and write out the question you'll very quickly be led to the section of answer in genesis that gives you uh, really excellent answers you you, you would uh, find it hard to think of a question that's not answered on that website on that, yeah lots of answers um on, on the website well thanks Stuart, for your time uh, this evening i know it's valuable you've got a lot to do uh, but we appreciate um you taking time out your busy schedule to speak to us Okay, thank you. Keep well. Yeah. And for those that are watching, um, we will be having more interviews um, with, with different creation speakers over the next coming uh, weeks as we're stuck in isolation. But we hope that this is encouraging to your faith. It helps you to think about the issues and to dig deeper. And we will um, put some relevant articles um, in the comments section when we post this online. So thank you for watching. God bless.